Hello, and I think I think we're now live. I am going to mute. Yes, lovely. Um, and Rory, if you wanted to. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, welcome to our, our fifth episode um, of the Future of Foraging second se series. Um, we've got two super interesting talks today um, on the topic of um, um, food caching in foraging. Um, so I'll just, yeah, introduce myself. I'm Rory. Uh, here we have our other um, um, organizer law agreement. And then uh, we have uh, down here or up here, Lucia Jacobs and um, uh, Hannah Payne. And um, yeah, so I'll just uh, kick us off. Well, first of all, maybe I'll just quickly outline the the structure of these uh, uh, of this seminar. So we're going to have two 25 minute talks during that time. Um, um, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, at the end of <laughs> at the end of those talks, we'll have um, five minutes of kind of uh, audience questions. Feel free to uh, write any questions you might have in the in the question ask a questions box below or or also in the chat. Um, yeah, is um, then after the two talks, so uh, um, we'll have so after about an hour, we'll then move on to a more uh, open um, sort of roundtable discussion again audience please feel free to uh, chuck any questions you might have uh, into the into the box and we'll uh, endeavor to cover as many of them as possible but for now i'll just uh, introduce our first uh, well our speakers so first uh, lucia jacobs uh, lucia is a professor in the department of psychology and the institute of neuroscience at uc berkeley but she first entered the world of science with a bachelor's degree in neurobiology and behavior at Cornell University in 1978. She followed this with a master's in biology from Princeton in 1983. Um, she also stayed at Princeton for her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology, which she completed in 1987. And then her postdoctoral work led her into the fields of animal cognition, evolutionary psychology and behavioral neuroscience, first at the University of Toronto's Department of Psychology then to the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh, and then finally as a research assistant professor at the University of Utah. Uh, she then moved in 1993 uh, to the University of Berkeley, becoming a professor of psychology and neuroscience in 2012. And her work at UCB has taken her in the direction of neuro neuroeconomics, brain plasticity, and memory, particularly in the context of uh, food caching in squirrels and kangaroo rats. Um, should I... Sorry. I'll go for Hannah's intro as well, right? Now. Um, oh. Well, I think we'll, okay. we'll do that before Hannah starts. Okay, brilliant. So, um, so on that note, okay. I will uh, kick out everyone else. And Lucia, if you can please um, share your slides. So do you see my slides? They're just popping up now. Well, I see, I see us, and then yes, perfect. Slides. You are good okay. to go. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation. I love this series. It's a great idea. I want to, uh, since you're talking about foraging, I want to. Um, today we're kind of pushing the envelope to um, animals that use multi-stage foraging, um, not only forage but but cash. So, focusing today on food as capital, socioeconomics of hoarding decisions. So, I mean, hoarding is really interesting. Um, humans are the only primate that hoard. The Neolithic revolution was when humans began hoarding, which chained our, our evolutionary trajectory. Hoarding is constrained by the physical affordances of the food and the habitat, perishability, availability of food, and energy density. Nuts are perfect hoardable objects because they're not perishable and they're um, high, highly, um, you know, high energy density. But these physical affordances drive then the demands, cognitive and sensory, to harvest these precious items, defend and, re and retrieve them, which ends up um, creating squirrels basically plant forests um, or destroy forests. It's, it's a huge, uh, um, feedback loop with between the, um, the foraging decision and the physical environment. 
And because food is being concentrated, this then brings um, intensified social competition. They're constructing this, this um, niche, which then of course brings in pilferers and, with, and um, which leads to the need for defense and counter defenses. And so all of this together this, this, um, is this cauldron that produces these um, complex economic decisions that the, the um, forager, I mean, that the, the food store faces, not just foraging, but then all the decisions afterwards. And that's kind of what I wanna focus on today. So um, Amanda Robin, who's a graduate student, um, finishing her PhD at UCLA now studying Western gray squirrels. Uh, and I just published this um, brief review on, these, on this idea um, outlining the feedback loops between physical affordances and social, and, and social competition and how all of these together create food hoarding decisions. And this produces in squirrels, which are diurnal, um, especially, especially we, we focused on whole Arctic um, squirrels. So um, produces this fascinating variety of hoarding strategies from larder hoarding um, where a, a central bank, which is defended, typified by the Eurasian, uh, I mean, actually the North American red squirrel and scatter hoarding, the other end of the spectrum, typified by the Eastern gray squirrel, where every um, item is placed, is, is deposited a single time into a single location, which is not then reused. And then interestingly, the yellow pine chipmunk, Siberian chipmunk show mixed strategies where they go back and forth between scatter and larder, depending on the economics. And we've also found that in kangaroo rats. But so scatter hoarding, this single deposition is very, um, requires a, a lot of input to the decision. And this is our, uh, you know, a brief overview of what the squirrel has to, um, to use. I feel a little inarticulate, but it's eight o'clock in the morning and I'm not quite awake yet. All right. Why is it different from birds? It's because of the sense of smell. Um, Rodents have this incredible sense of smell, which allows them to steal um, caches. Everybody steals. This was the work uh, of Dr. Michael Delgado, who was a postdoc, who was a graduate student. Um, I'll be describing her work as a graduate student here. All at, um, she was a postdoc, and now she's um, recently um, joined the tech industry. So focal, um, this was, a, or, uh, as, as Michael said, this was her best friend in graduate school. This was Flame, who was a, who was a, um, who became, who, who was seven when Michael finished her thesis. The, um, so she followed Flame and over two months, caching 340 marked nuts, observing all the other squirrels. And basically all the, this is, um, every circle in, um, is, an, is a squirrel that stole from Flame. Um, the number of nuts stolen, the, the age of the squirrel, and, um, and the sex of the squirrel. So you can see everyone is stealing. This is just one snapshot. So the squirrel has this, faces this dilemma, which is they have to diversify their special portfolio. They have to scatter into all these locations. But how do you place those caches? How much time do you invest? There's a very short period of about eight weeks where they harvest the acorns and nuts for the um, the neck for the the winter. So the opportunity costs, if you're handling a nut too long, are severe. So you have to assess it. What's the value of this item? How much um, effort should I all should a squirrel spend assessing the item? And then once the item value has been um, has been determined the investment stage begins where the squirrel has to, can reduce its risk of pilferage by increasing the distance carried away from the source, which is the highest density of competitors. And once reaching a place to cash by decreasing the cash density. And therefore that effort, it's very important that that should match the item value. So this is, um, there's two classic North American scatter hoarders that have been studied. Um, in, in detail, but they're also some of the most um, specialized scatter hoarders uh, of any squirrel, of you know, of um, of any continent. 
and they co-evolved with these trees. They, the trees produce these odorless nuts. The squirrel has to cash three to 5,000 a year. If the squirrel dies, that's of course three to 5,000 seedlings. So you've got this co-evolutionary dance. The trees fight back by masting. So they, they produce nuts um, unpredictably so that there's some years they crash and therefore all the squirrels must migrate or starve. That um, because the, the trees are unpredictable, the territory, unlike the larder hoarding, cone eating red squirrels and chipmunks, the scatter hoarding Sayura species cannot defend a territory. And therefore, instead of defending a cache with physical contact as a larder hoarder would, they have to use cognition. And so this is the hard nut problem. They've got 20 million years of the, these two species co-evolving, or these, this genus co-evolving with these um, tree species that um, vary enormously in their, um, in their defenses, whether it's the thick, the physical defenses, the shell thickness, or the or chemical defenses like the bitter membranes of pecan, and that uh, and the tree adjusts the reward to the squirrel to attract the squirrel to disperse it. At the same time, the um, the squirrel is also a predator. Okay, and. Only big squirrels can eat these nuts efficiently. This is a black walnut opened by a Sayuris 500 gram versus a Tammy Sayuris 250 gram. You can see it's much less efficient. And these nut opening techniques must be learned. Um, this has been uh, studied since um, 1950 by Eibel Eibelsfeld. So the squirrel faces this fiscal year where the winter capital determines its investment. They have their major breeding season is midwinter. They're extremely large brain species. They're long lived. They can live up to be 20 years in captivity. They have a 44 day gestation. They're two months in the nest. And then it takes 15 weeks to learn to open nuts. In the spring, the capital is depleted. The nuts all germinate. Therefore, the squirrels have to switch foraging. It's fascinating what they eat in the spring. There's evidence that they, they uh, farm maple samaras, but they're, they're eating fresh foods. Summer, they're starving. It's the lowest income season. Their body weight is down. You have 75% juvenile mortality. Um, they're living on insects and mushrooms. Um, if they survive that first year, then they're, they're, um, then they're fine. And in the fall, therefore, that's how, cr how critical these caching decisions are. They, um, it's starting in July, they start mapping the trees, they start sampling trees to figure out which are the optimal food tree species in my PhD thesis. All the squirrels first um, start attacking the tree that has the largest nuts with the thinnest shells and um, because they're trying to replace their body weight um, as, as soon as possible. Um, and, um, and, um, and of course, those early trees get wiped out. Okay, so this is a multi-stage foraging decision. You have to assess and you have to invest. So you're an economist. So I like to say to neuroscientists, all rodents are not equal. So um, Stephanie Preston, her, her, in her thesis, she's now, she switched to studying human economic decisions at Michigan now, uh, showed that squirrels use two movements, the paw manipulation um, and the head flick. And, and the head flick is associated, she showed through experiments, with the mass of the nut, so that the head flick is essentially, we actually got to, to quote Newton, it's measuring the mass by controlling the force and acceleration. And you see these unique behaviors before, as a squirrel picks up an item and decides what to do with it. And what, um, what we found, this was um, Michael's work, was we see increased assessment when things are more scarce. This is exactly what you see in humans where people's decision-making processes change in, in, in position in, in times of scarcity. So across the season on the left there, you can see food is scarce in the summer. They assess higher value nuts more carefully. So those are hazelnuts. And you see a difference in the summer, but not in the fall um, in hazelnuts, but less in peanuts. But even within um, a season, within a, a trial bout, we gave them a um, series of 15 nuts. We alternated hazelnuts, high value, and peanuts. 
And what you can see is over the course of the trial, they begin by increase, having increased number of head flicks when it's the first nut they see. It's the first nut of the morning. It's a very, um, it's, an, it's, it's, a, um, it's a valuable relative to the context of foraging up to the point where you show up with a bag of nuts. That's a very high value item. Um, but it's in a, it's also in a period of scarcity. And as we get to nut 15, they realize that um, the nuts are going to keep coming. They spend less time um, assessing them. So the, the next problem is once you've um, assessed, you have to invest and you have to cash. And we call this the password problem because it really is a password problem where the squirrel has to remember where it's cached three or 5,000 nuts, but not a code that um, a pilferer can, can detect. Um, there's no territorial defense. We've, I've shown in kangaroo rats that cash owners are, are 30 under completely controlled conditions. Cash owners are 30% um, more efficient. That's actually in Eastern Greys and in Miriam's kangaroo rats. So they can outcompete pilferers using memory. And Michael's work was also showed, she genotyped the squirrels in the Berkeley campus and, and examined um, individual differences in cash areas and showed that caches were more likely to overlap with squirrels that were more closely related. So we think there's also reciprocal pilfering and kin selection um, going on, help, helping offset the costs of, um, of pilferage. So what the squirrels do is invest, again, they've assessed the nut, they invest proportionate to value. These are, um, again, Michael's data showing more valuable nuts are cached farther from the source. Walnuts and pecans, those are high, they're, they're heavier and they have higher lipid content than hazelnuts and almonds. So we will use those colors consistently. Uh, we saw a difference whether or not they were given the, the nut, um, the multi-site foragers, when they were given a nut, they cached it and they were given a next nut at, at the place near the cat where they cached it versus central place where they had to keep coming back. Um, and what's interesting, the central place, they seem to have um, categorization of a small nut, um, and hazelnut versus a large nut, um, pecan walnut, and have um, possibly a rule here. I hate to say the world word um, heuristic around Alex, but I will, that they defaulted to high and low uh, categories. They, they invest proportion to weight. Again, they're weighing them with a head flick. Within species, there's natural variation, and we could show with three of the four species that the distance was significantly related to the weight of the nut. Not true of walnuts. Um, walnuts are, are large packets, difficult to store, um, and we think also very high opportunity cost. So there's a lot of complex decisions here. Plus, on top of that, they're caching nuts at larger nuts at lower densities. So pil pilferers are going to find one nut, and then they're going to go into area-restricted search. And so you want to increase the nearest neighbor distance to the, to the foil. And that's what we found. The nearest neighbor distance was beautifully predicted by the value of the nut. So what this um, the squirrel has to do as it's caching is remember where all the other nuts are of that species so that it can also maintain this, this density. So the question is, does it work? Michael um, tracked um, thousands of tagged nuts and squirrels. It turned out to be, even on the Berkeley campus where we had kind of optimal conditions, it turned out to be very difficult. So she instead examined um, cash lifespan, asking how long was a, a cash in the in the um, in the ground. We had um, undergraduates running transics um, with RFID readers to determine the fate of of fourteen over fourteen hundred nuts. And what she found was the investment behaviors at the time of caching predicts the cash, cash lifespan. So that suggests that these behaviors these um, are in fact working. The cash loss may be primarily pilferage. So she tracked 20 squirrels and showed, for example, the squirrels, the longer they spent caching a nut um, when its whole body was observed, um, then 
um, they spent longer caching a nut when their whole body was observed. So if they're in the middle of the grass, they would spend more time caching a nut than if they were hidden in a bush while caching. Um, again, this investment, they spend more time, this is within hazelnuts, and we're again seeing this, this, this weight effect. But just here is a detail, um, the, the, the difference between half a gram makes a significant difference to a squirrel. As you can see, they'll spend more time. This we showed, I showed before distance, this is total caching time. So this is natural variation, and that the, underlines the importance of the assessment phase. And finally, the cache exposure is life, the cache life is in fact predicted by exposure. So when caches were, um, again, this was from zero to 300 days, the average cache life was 32 days. When the, um, the caches were mostly concealed is you see the highest cache life. So when the body was over one half hidden during caching, caching that's when um, the, they were, um, most that, that's when they survive the longest, which suggests that the losses are pilferage. And observations by us, Mike Steele, have shown other squirrels watching each other and actually um, coming from 100 meters to steal a cache. We uh, this is something that is is really ripe for future future research. Um, at 18 months. The, there were still caches present, and they were interestingly along Hearst Avenue, which, if you know Berkeley, is extremely busy thoroughfare where you've got um, danger of people, dogs, and cars. And perhaps we, in under natural conditions, um, eastern gray squirrels are more likely to cache uh, when, when high predation risk. They will cache in open areas where it becomes it's the, it's the trade off. It's the um, the, the landscape of fear for a pilferer, it's very dangerous to steal a cache in an open uh, area. So we um, asked if squirrels chunk because uh, Christina um, Warren Mech and, and um, showed a lovely study in, in radial arm maze and rats that if you, if you bait a, um, a maze with multiple types of food and you maintain the locations of those multiple types consistently, the rats are more accurate in acquiring the radial arm maze. So we know, that, of course, humans chunk in, in working memory, but the question is, would a scatter hoarder utilize spatial chunking to increase its accuracy? And um, Michael did this by looking at um, these, um, uh, by again, using four species of nuts. There were 16 nuts. They were either, again, central location. Um, they were handed out from a central location, either in runs of four of each type or pseudo random series. And um, under both conditions, we found squirrels organized by nut species. There was significant la lack of overlap between nut species in the final distribution um, in, the, in these, um, and this is, this is an example of one, of one fem of an adult female. So there was a significant um, separation. So this was the first evidence that a scatter hoarder under natural conditions might be using something like spatial chunking. Um, except under certain conditions. So when the, um, the next, when we did this multi-site, a pseudo-random multi-site, you can see here the overlap for that condition when, when, when it was a no fixed origin and unpredictable, suddenly the over, overlap was complete. And that's again, fascinating observation. What we think is it's either the cognitive, cognitive load of, um, but also they, they couldn't keep, they couldn't remember where the other nuts of that species had been cached, or they were actually, it was optimization. They were, they knew where they were, but they were minimizing the distance because if suddenly every fifth, if, if after five nuts, they get an almond, they would have to return because it's a multi-site condition. They would have to return a, a long distance to find the, um, the last almond. And so it might be actually this, the, um, the overlap might actually be an optimization. So we, this, this again, r remains to be determined. So I hope I've, um, emphasized, I've, I've um, convinced you that squirrels face a complex series of decisions in, in caching, that food storing is a fascinating window into foraging decisions. 
in summary, ho um, hoarding in birds and squirrels is um, reshapes the selective environment, particularly in squirrels, which are actually literally um, planting their food sources. This constrains their economic behavior, whether they end up in larder, scatter, or mixed strategy. The mixed strategy, um, of course, is fascinating. Scatter, as you can, as I hope I've convinced you, is an information economy facing this hard nut problem and the password problem. They have to manage these multiple stages to realize the profit, which may be nine months later, to search, to, to search for an item, to assess, to decide whether to eat or cash to begin with, then if to cash, where to cash, they have to remember where the, the prior caches were to maintain density, to maintain their spatial chunking. And then they have to maintain these parameters as caches are removed and squirrels continually maintain and check and move caches all winter. So they have to have this memory of where the caches were to maintain these, again, these, these, um, uh, these parameters. And then they decide, should we are we eat my own or pill for someone else's? And if you're gonna pill for, do you eat it or do you then recache it? It's, it's, I'm just touching, we just really scraped the surface on the complexity of this. So I'd like to thank this took the, um, mo even more undergraduates than pictured here and support of NSF and um, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Lucia. That was that was really fascinating. Oh my goodness, the the complexity, like you said, is really um, uh, like almost overwhelming, right? There are so many different strategies. Um, I, I mean, uh, we have, oh, we just had a question come in um, from the audience, actually from Rory, I think. Um, and uh, uh, Rory says, uh, great talk. Um, do, do you have an idea of approximately how much time squirrels dedicate to um, caching versus pilfering? And is there evidence of inter-individual variation in the tendency to pilfer? I think there's no question there's going to be in, in individual differences because you know, squirrels, there's a lot of, of good studies now about personality differences in, in several different squirrel species. I'm sure that's, um, there's going to be, there's going to, I bet there's, there's going to be economic decisions that are going to vary with that. Uh, we, um, the pilfering is interesting. I think there might be individual differences. Uh, I mean, the answer is no. We only know from, ca from captive at work. And the captive work, what I've seen, and this was my PhD thesis, is that squirrels would come into an arena where I would set up, and this is also true with kangaroo rats, is we'd set up, an, I'd set up an arena with their own caches and then an equal number of decoys of others from other kangaroo rats or other squirrels. And a squirrel who was hungry would come in and just hit all its own caches first. And that once partially satiated would then start trial and error search and pick up other caches. And there were, you know, anecdotally, a squirrel would come in and I would have a, its own cache and a decoy cache and, and these, its own cache, the nuts have been replaced. So there shouldn't have been strong odor cues that all, both nuts should have had the same odor. And, and a, a nut that was three centimeters away from a decoy, it would pick up its own and keep going. Sometimes it would pick up the decoy and keep going, which suggests that they had a, um, you know, a, you know, a cognitive map of these, of its 10 nuts. And if it found, if it stumbled on someone else's nut, then that box was checked and it would keep going. So my, my impression is that it's going to be very context specific. If, um, I mean, one, one selective pressure on squirrels is this, these are all, of course, temperate species that experience, um, you know, cold conditions, ice and, and deep snow. And squirrels can detect um, caches under snow, under left foot of snow, but they, I mean, they've got excellent sense of smell, but it's extremely expensive. And what you see is after a big snow um, fall, squirrels don't come out, they kind of hang out. And then when they do come out, they, you can see by tracks in the snow, they beeline and go straight down through the cat, uh, through the snow, pick up a cache and go back to a branch to eat it. So that's, I mean, I think that it's one of these bottleneck situations where the memory, the, the importance of the memory is not so much in a, on a warm day in November, but it's a freezing day in February where you've got, um, 
not only snow but frozen snow where this the the um to to you cannot the trial and error search no longer works long that those are those are some of my diverse thoughts on that important question um, oh, no, excellent. Yeah, thank you. And I actually, I'm going to be greedy and, and ask a question myself, if that's okay, because I'm really curious about the um, the role of the environment um, at, at multiple levels in terms of how that affects the animal's uh, strategy in, in terms of how they cache. And um, the sort of two different variables I had in mind was, um, on the one hand, like urbanization. And I think you mentioned this before in terms of how, um, for example, pilfering happens less in a sort of denser, more urban environments. Um, but I'm wondering, actually, in terms of the physical like, uh, like constraints that urbanization has on the strategy that the squirrel might take in order to cash. Um, and uh, sorry, on a, on a related note, the sort of average uh, richness of the environment as well, right? Because that will also be dependent on, I guess, to some extent, how urban the environment is. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that sort of is kind of curious. I don't I don't think they're caching pilfering less in urban environments. Um, I, I, uh, I what I, my last point was that I think the pilfering the, there's a very strong pressure under natural conditions about um, about I you know the value of pilfering and yeah. that that you, basically pilfering works all year except when it doesn't work and that's when that's the bottleneck when you could die. Um, I think I mean urban environments you've got all these non um, other food supply you know throughout throughout the year. Yeah. My, my, but my impression, I mean, the lovely thing about squirrels, I mean, I'm sorry, um, but in, compared to birds, <laughs> is that they cache all the time. You can't stop them from caching. And they will cache in a crack, you know, in, in tiny little patches of grass on an urban sidewalk. Um, they, you know, I've got some incredible observations um, from Central Park, New York. That's an amazing place to watch squirrels caching. All kinds of fascinating decision making going on there. Um, course that um so but, but the urbanization um i mean squirrels the gray squirrel the eastern gray squirrel this piece this is actually um a fox squirrel but the particularly the eastern gray squirrel it's actually one of the world's most invasive species right now it's extremely adaptable uh, uh, as you know adapting britain uh italy um, outcompeting the native red squirrels it's actually becoming a real scourge because it lives so easily in urban environments where I'm sure, where, where, but they continue caching anything they can cache and pilfering. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. That's, that's uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's obviously a very strong, um, strong drive for them. Uh, yeah, th thank you so much, uh, Lucia. That was, again, really interesting. I think um, we should probably now move on to uh, uh, the second talk for today, um, but we'll see you back on screen uh, okay. later for the, for the round table. But thank you again. Okay. That was, that was, uh, okay. yeah. Super interesting. Okay, and so now my job is to do all the technical stuff. Uh, here we go. So I'm going to invite Hala. Here we go. And I will. Um, perfect. Thank you. Here we go. Okay, lovely, Hala. Great. Yeah, so I'm back for another intro. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks so much, Lucia, for that amazing talk. Super interesting. Um, but yeah, so just to introduce our second speaker, uh, Hannah Payne. So Hannah started on the path of academia in 2007, um, beginning a bachelor's degree in neuroscience and engineering at the University of Dartmouth College. And here she worked on a number of projects, including analysis of MRI coupled fluorescent tomography images of brain tumors and on the role of post subiculum in uh, contextual fear conditioning under the supervision of uh, Dr. David Bucci. Uh, she continued her work on neuroscience and the visual system as a research assistant at Harvard Medical School under uh, Dr. Chin-Fei Chen in 2010. Uh, and here she used electrophysiology to study synaptic remodeling in visual system development in mice. Um, in 20 11, she began her PhD at Stanford University with supervision from Dr. Jennifer Raymond and Dr. Mark Goldman. And during her PhD, she investigated circuit mechanisms of cerebellum dependent motor learning, assessed rate and temporal coding schemes underlying ocular motor behavior, uh, and developed a magnetic eye tracking method for mice. Uh, and during the PhD, she also collaborated with Dr. Michael Fee at the MIT modeling synaptic uh, mechanisms of neural sequence formation and splitting uh, during vocal learning in songbirds. Uh, 
And uh, after the success of her PhD, Hannah moved to Columbia University to join the lab of Dmitry Aronov, where she currently works as a postdoc. Um, here she studies the neural mechanisms of spatial memory formation in food caching birds, particularly in the hipp hippocampus. So yeah, we're really excited to hear about this fascinating work. So um, whenever you're ready, Hannah, please take it away. Okay, so unmuted and share screen. Um, all right, how does that look? That's looking really nice, Hannah. Yeah, perfect. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, Rory, for that introduction. Um, I am really excited and honored to be here. And I um, want to especially thank the organizers for putting on such a fun series. Um, as, as Rory said, I'm a postdoc in Dmitry Arnov's lab at uh, Columbia. And today, uh, you know, now I'm going to switch over to birds and tell you about the hippocampus in food caching birds. So this is an example of a food caching bird. Um, and you're going to see it taking uh, seeds from this pile and then hop over to the snow. And it's going to stuff it firmly into the snow right there. And what this animal does is then try to hide its cache from pilferers, as you heard about previously. And so it took a leaf. And then just to be sure, it's taking one more leaf to attempt to hide its cache. Um, so as Lucia very clearly introduced, uh, this type of food caching is known as scatter hoarding uh, because individual pieces of food are stored at scattered locations across the environment as shown here. And there's a lot of nice modeling work uh, in birds as, as well as in mammals asking why birds cache. Uh, and, and I won't get into this too much here other than to say that it's especially useful when it's costly to carry extra food as fat, uh, such as you know, due to metabolic costs or the risks of predation. And it's also especially beneficial when food supply is variable, such as during mast years. Um, and this has been shown in the lab as well. When the food supply becomes more variable, birds will greatly increase the amount of caching that they do. On the other hand, there, uh, there's the risk of pilfering and, of course, the investment of time and energy, as, as Lucia really clearly uh, explained. So in birds, uh, this, this kind of uh, food caching behavior is fairly unusual but it's not isolated. So there are at least 12 families of birds that have been shown to store food. Some of these are um, larder hoarding, whereas some of these are scatter hoarding. And within each of these families, there's variability. So within the family that includes chickadees, which is one of the most widely studied species of food caching bird, its cousin, the great tit, uh, the great tit does not cache food, whereas its other cousin, the tufted titmouse does. And these two examples, the, the black-capped chickadee and the tufted titmouse, are not random. They are both found uh, in New York State. And so these are the birds that we study uh, in the lab. So our big question is, how does the brain implement food caching? And since memory for food caches is a form of spatial memory, early researchers realized that the hippocampus might be involved. So this is a schematic I made showing what the hippocampus looks like in a food caching bird. And sure enough, early researchers, both in Canada and across the Iron Curtain in Russia, uh, early on, performed hippocampal lesions in food caching birds. And they both found that memory for caches was significantly impaired while sparing the ability, while sparing the ability to make caches in the first place. So the hippocampus is really necessary for retrieval of, of food caches. And additionally, it turns out that the hippocampus is also dramatically enlarged in food caching birds uh, compared to non-food caching birds. So here I'm plotting the volume of the hippocampus normalized by the volume of the telencephalon. And this is a log scale, so this is rough, roughly a threefold uh, increase in size on average. So this was all really in, uh, intriguing, but when Dimitri started his lab in 2017, we still had no idea what was going on in the hippocampus of food caching birds in terms of neural activity because no one had ever recorded from their hippocampus. Um, so of course, most of the work on the hippocampus and uh, memory, hippocampus dependent memory has been done previously in mammals. And it wouldn't be surprising if things are really different in birds because we are very distantly related. Our, our last common ancestor was some kind of lizard that existed uh, 300, over 300 million years ago. And so, uh, in our, in our lab, we wondered whether animals that perform 
Similarly sophisticated memory tasks like food caching birds might use similar neural mechanisms to what's been uh, shown in mammals. Um, and, so the, and, this, and because they're specialists, you might even be able to learn even more about hippocampus dependent memory. Um, and so this raises the question of whether the neural mechanisms that have been proposed in mammals are these more fundamental and potentially shared across a wide range of vertebrates, or are there multiple solutions? And so we decided to address this by recording in the hippocampus of the tufted titmouse, uh, which is bigger than a chickadee, which is why we started with it, but it's still fairly small. And so we adapted a miniature microdrive design that allowed us to record from these birds during free motion. And so this microdrive allowed us to record cells from the hippocampus with a range of firing rates, which corresponded to classic putative excitatory and inhibitory cells uh, that have been identified in mammals. Um, and these are identified through clusters based on waveform and firing rate characteristics, as in the mammalian hippocampus. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on the excitatory cells. And so to start off, when I, when I joined the lab, um, I decided to record while birds explored a, a two foot by two foot open arena uh, where they're foraging for sunflower seed fragments that are randomly dropped from the ceiling using an automatic seed dispenser. And now this experiment doesn't involve memory or caching because it was designed to first look at neural activity at baseline while the animal simply explores space and, and forages for food. Um, and this has the additional benefit of mirroring classic experiments conducted in the rodent hippocampus. So in this experiment, we can track the bird's location in this 2D arena uh, over time. And just a technicality, the, the flight feathers are trimmed. So we're just looking at 2D to keep things simple to start off. And so I'm gonna plot the location of the bird in black and wherever a spike was recorded is being plotted in red. And so in this example, you can see the bird is running up into this upper right corner and the cell fires again. And we can do this for an entire half hour to an hour long session and get a trajectory like this. Um, and we can summarize this by plotting the average firing rate uh, in each region of, of this two dimensional arena. And that looks like this for this example cell. So this, so this resembles, uh, this example resembles the classic play cells that have been described in rodents because these cells fire spikes whenever the animal visits specific locations in space. Um, and in, in mammals, play cells are central to models of memory in the hippocampus because they're thought to help uh, represent and therefore help remember where important things happened, such as hiding a piece of food. And so this suggests that the bird hippocampus might use a similar strategy to keep track of spatial location uh, as is done in mammals. However, I want to back up for a minute and tell you how we got here. So when I first started these experiments, I kept only finding cells like this. These are, these are six example cells that only have very messy spatial tuning, which was a little disappointing, but we, we eventually realized that the hippocampus is really big in tip mice. And we had picked the coordinates for recording initially somewhat arbitrarily based on existing bird atlases from other species that were not food cachers. And it turns out that we were recording way back here, as you can see in, the, in this top down view of the hippocampus. And so we realized that the hippocampus extends much farther anteriorly than, than we had originally thought. And when I recorded throughout its extent, this is what I saw. Um, and so as we go more anterior, we see more and more place cells uh, with very restricted peak firing fields. And I can summarize this or quantify this by plotting the amount of information that each recorded cell carries about space as a function of the cell's recording location in the hippocampus. And summarize this by plotting the fraction of all cells that were significantly spatial, so the fraction of the red cells here. And so this shows that there's a gradient along this anterior to posterior axis, where in the posterior hippocampus, there are very few spatial cells. Whereas in the anterior hippocampus, about 70% of cells represent space. Um, so this was pretty surprising to us at first, but if you look at the development of the hippocampus, it actually makes a lot of sense. So during development in both mammals and birds, the hippocampus forms from the same part of the neural tube, which is shown here in cross section. Now in mammals, this medial, medial wall of the neural tube 
folds in on itself like this, which gives rise to the various subdivisions of the hippocampus that are seen in adults. Now, in contrast, in birds, this, this medial region stays unfolded on the surface, even in adults. And this homology is supported by gene expression studies as well. And so this is a cross section in 3D. This is what it looks like. And so even though overall it looks quite different, there's this long axis that can be described from uh, kind of dorsal to ventral in rodents and from anterior to posterior in birds. And we know in rodents that place cells are mainly found in their dorsal hippocampus, which is shown here in pink. Um, this is also known as the, the septotemporal axis or the, the dorsal ventral axis. And this, this dorsal area corresponds to the anterior region in birds where we see place cells as well. And so this result adds evidence that this long axis is indeed homologous, not only developmentally, but also functionally. So even though the brain looks very different, this organization of spatial coding is the same. So this is really exciting that this precise spatial coding not only exists, but is organized similarly in uh, birds and, and uh, rodents. Uh, and this suggests that the bird hippocampus might use a similar strategy to keep track of where things happen. But at this point, you might be wondering, has no one really done this before in birds? Um, and it turns out that recordings had been made previously in a couple other birds, in uh, pigeons and in quails. But this is the kind of spatial activity that was reported. So we wondered, why is there such a difference in our results? And there's a few possibilities. So we wondered whether uh, maybe these recordings just didn't find the right part of this long axis gradient. Or maybe there's something special about food caching birds. Or of course, we had to rule out any differences in technique between labs. So to test this, we decided to repeat all of these experiments in a non-food caching bird. Um, and we, we used the zebra finch because it was readily available in the lab. And when, we were, when I recorded from the zebra finch, this is what we saw. So there's definitely some spatial coding and there's a consistent gradient from posterior to anterior, but it's not as impressive as in, in the titmouse or, or in the rat. Um, and I actually had to record from this very anterior end to find these cells. And we can quantify this in a few ways. <clears throat> so the, uh, the fraction of the hippocampus that has a large number of place cells uh, is greater in tit mice, about 60% of this anterior posterior extent compared to 50% in zebra finches. And even within this region, more cells are spatial. And we can quantify this by just zooming in on this, on this region <clears throat> here and see that um, the cells within this highly spatial region in titmouse uh, have higher spatial information uh, than in zebra finch. And they're also more, the representation of space is also more stable over the course of the recording session, which is just the, which is the difference uh, shown here. So it seems like spatial representations are both more extensive and more refined in, in, the, in this food caching bird. Um, and we don't know why this is, but I can speculate that having this kind of extensive and sparse representation of space might make it easier to create many independent and precise spatial memories that would be helpful for food caching. Okay, so so far I've looked at the activity of neurons during online behavior when the animal is actively moving around. Um, but from rodents, we know that offline activity when the animal is resting is also important for memory. Um, and in particular, sharp wave ripples are basically these, these large synchronous bursts of neural activity, which look like this in electrical recordings. And so this is the, this is the sharp wave, this is the high frequency ripple. <clears throat> and these sharp wave ripples in rats <clears throat> are known to be important for the consolidation of new memories, among other, among other uh, ideas. So similar to place cells, previous recordings in birds had not reported sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus. Uh, but we had tufted tit mice already implanted with electrodes, and so we let them fall asleep. Um, and this is what a sleeping tufted tit mouse looks like, and it's quite easy to tell when it's woken up. Um, and sure enough, we, when we recorded from these birds during sleep, <clears throat> we saw events that looked a lot like sharp wave ripples. So here's an example of a single event. You can see the negative sharp wave. When I filter in the ripple band, you can see the high frequency ripple. 
and there's spikes that are aligned to this event. <clears throat> and when I plot the probability of spiking over all of the recorded sharp wave ripple events, um, you can see that the spikes are precisely time locked to the ripple oscillation, just like in rodents. Uh, and I'm not showing the data here, but we also see these events in the zebra finch. So we were actually really surprised to see these events in either species of bird, because in rodents, the ability to detect sharp wave ripples is thought to be at least partly due to the, the, this very crystalline organization of the hippocampus. So in rodents, there's this dense pyramidal cell layer uh, with very um, parallel dendrites, which in theory allow small individual signal, electrical signals from each cell to sum together into a larger detectable uh, sharp wave ripple event. And in keeping with this, the shape of the sharp wave ripple waveform changes depending on which layer you're in in the rodent hippocampus. So it changes from this negative deflection in the stratum radiatum to more of a positive, uh, smaller deflection in the pyramidal cell layer. Now in the bird, if we look at an analogous cross-section of the, of the bird hippocampus, there's nothing that resembles this really clear, dense pyramidal cell layer. Um, so we were surprised to see these events, but we still, you know, given that we see them, we wanted to know whether there was any functional organization that might correspond to, to this laminar organization uh, that was seen in, in, in mammals. And so to do this, we recorded across the entire depth of the hippocampus. So this is now orthogonal to the long axis that I was describing earlier. And when we record th uh, progressively throughout this depth, we do see that the, the, sh the sharp wave ripple waveform changes with depth, with the sharp wave getting more negative as you go towards the ventricle. And we can do this even more systematically by recording across the entire plane with an array of electrodes and then systematically advancing them uh, through the, the tip mouse hippocampus. And we can then uh, look at how these, these voltages at this time of the sharp wave change over space, uh, or, over location within the brain. Um, and this is a technique called current source density, which is derived from these voltages. But what it shows is where current is flowing into cells and where current is flowing out of cells, uh, you know, approximately as a population. And so what this result is showing is that, um, it's not moving. Uh, so what this is showing is that there is a this current sink layer near the ventricle, which is shown in blue. And this represents where overall positive electrical current is flowing into cells out of the extracellular space. Uh, and in the rat hippocampus, this is generally associated with lots of synchronous excitatory input uh, coming into, into dendrites. And in contrast, there's a current source near the surface, which is shown in red. And this is thought to represent where positive current is flowing out of cells and is more associated with cell bodies, uh, return currents, and perhaps inhibition. So what this means is that even though the hippocampus looks fairly uniform in terms of how the cell bodies are arranged, there's this functional organization uh, into two layers, this current sink near the ventricle and a current source uh, near the surface. And to compare this with what, what we know in rodents, um, in rats, there's also two layers of current sources and sinks that are organized along the same cross-section. Uh, that's, and that's shown here. So it looks like something similar is again happening in birds, maybe due to a more subtle arrangement of cells, maybe differences in cellular properties, or maybe differences in where synaptic inputs are active during these sharp wave ripple events. But whatever it is, it's sufficient to produce this layered pattern. Okay, so overall, we're getting this picture where, despite this very large evolutionary separation, we see play cells, we see sharp wave ripples, and there's even a similar anatomical organization along these orthogonal axes for both of these features. And we don't know, of course, what is conserved and what is convergent. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but it's tempting to speculate that the basic blueprint for this kind of circuit is much older than we had previously thought. Um, but at the same time, this weaker spatial coding that we see in the zebra finch suggests that this knob can potentially be turned, in, even in more closely related species. And so spatial representations might vary according to ethological demands, in this case, food caching and spatial memory ability, 
even in relatively closely related species. Um, so I'd like to especially thank uh, the RNF lab, especially Dimitri and Steph Hale, who's done a lot, who's been extremely helpful with all of our bird work, um, the rest of the lab and my funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. That was excellent. Thank you, Hannah. Really interesting comparison there between the, um, I, I mean, actually even within birds, I, 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 might, I might again be greedy and start with a question of my own if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was kind of curious when when you um, were recording from uh, the titmouse and then recording also from the zebra finch in your open arena, um, did you uh, happen to notice any differences in in the way that the birds actually approached following where you were rewarding, you know, you were dropping in rewards, um, that their behavior? So I'm, I'm wondering whether the source of the difference in the representation perhaps might also be somehow reflective in how they approach, um, I don't know, like, not pursuing reward, but like sort of uh, how they approach exploring an, an arena environment or, or something like that. Yeah, so you're asking about kind of behavioral differences and whether that can be tied into yes, exactly. representations yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so of course it's it's because these are, these are different species and it's really hard to, you know, they're not going to behave exactly the same, although we have done a bunch of controls for making sure that they're you know, they, they have the same coverage of the arena, they're right, right. moving at roughly the same speeds. And even if we, you know, sub-select for sessions where the speeds are perfectly matched and things, it, it's, it all, um, it still holds up. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, and we've thought a little bit about trying, you know, kind of pie in the sky experiments where you could try to train a zebra finch to care more about space. Um, Cause the, kind of the way I think about it is that a food caching bird even though it's not food caching in this experiment, it might still be experiencing space differently because it might be, you know, prepared to food cache. Whereas if the zebra finch never caches food, it might just not be, um, you know, paying attention to space in the same way. And it would be really interesting to see if turning those knobs would change the neural representations. Yeah. Yeah, so sort of also trying to translate it into a, I guess, a more natural environment as well. Like um, mm -hmm. there are differences in terms of how they uh, sort of approach exploring environments, which would then potentially change the sort of um, encoding of, of space uh, in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the other the, the other kind of way that knob can be turned is even within food caching birds, there are seasonal differences. You know, just like just like in squirrels. Um, and there's really nice work from Pravasudev and and others showing um, that, that there are differences even in the size of the hippocampus seasonally. And so it'd be interesting if those differences in kind of focus on caching at different times of the year would also translate into differences in, um, in the hipp hippocampal representations. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, no, that, that makes, uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm multitasking here a little bit looking at the questions. Um, and uh, Rory has a uh, another question here. Um, so Hannah, um, he's asking, he says, very interesting work. Um, could you clarify, do, do you see a gradient of spatial specificity in cells as you look more anteriorly in the hippocampus or are the cells categorically like either they're spatial coding or they're not spatial coding cells? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a gradient of both the fraction of cells that, you know, statistically come out significantly spatial, but also the kind of amount of information that they are conveying. So I don't know if you can see this, but this was quantifying for each cell how informative it is about space. And the, you know, the whole distribution is shifting in a kind of a continuum along this axis. And so when you quantify just whether each cell is significant or not, it comes out as this kind of sigmoid. But um, yeah, it's, it seems like a really gradual transition, both in terms of fraction of cells that are spatial and the and, and their kind of precision, their, their coding properties. Um, and, and we have uh, one, one more question, um, this time from Lucia actually, um, and she asks, uh, what about zebra finches encoding mm -hmm. social information spatially? Um, so living in, in huge flocks, uh, dominance may be reflected by location within the nesting colony or the flock, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there, so I can close this screen. Um, yeah, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are if there is more representation socially uh, in species that, for that you know that care about that. Um, there's there's some really nice examples of birds that like like cowbirds, which um, 
instead of food caching, they have to learn about other birds' nests in order to kind of parasitize their nests. They'll, they'll lay, female cowbirds will lay their eggs in the nests of other species. Um, and so in the spring, they will go around and learn the locations of all these potential alternative nests. And so, um, and yeah, so, so in birds that care more about social issues, like that, or, um, they could also represent that. And that's been shown in bats as well recently. So yeah, that would be really interesting. Okay, um, I think that is, uh, I mean, Alex has a question for, for both you and Lucia. So I think that's a good prompt to invite um, the others back on screen. But thanks again, Hannah, that was, that was great. Uh, and let me do my technical stuff now. There we go. Uh, da -da. Sorry, so we'll just wait for them. Here we go. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think we can kick off maybe with with that question from from Alex, if that's okay. Um, uh, he's asking uh, to, to to both of you. Um, have, have you got information on on how uh, subjects respond to the size of their cache? So non-caching animals respond to their fat reserves. Um, caching animals store out of their body, and it's interesting to see how responsive they are to their capital. So what do you mean by the size of the cache? Um, the size of the, in, the entire cache? I mean, all caches together or? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think you say internal versus external um, scarcity. I, I mean, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think, um, I mean, in squirrels, it's clear that, uh, you know, fat squirrels make different decisions than thin squirrels because the, 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 the first, um, I mean, and it's the same thing as Hannah pointed out, squirrels are arboreal, you know, we've, they, they depend on being able to leap um, to, uh, to escape predators. And so they have to maintain a slim body profile, <laughs> uh, but, um, so, so that they, they start when they're very hungry and then they, they will fatten up, but then at some point they, they have to, um, stop eating. And, uh, it's, it's interesting because birds, birds only store food externally because of flight constraints. Mm -hmm. Kangaroo rats actually only f store food externally. They also don't gain because they are also incredibly, um, dependent on, on speed, um, to survive. So it's fascinating. Yeah, internal versus external storage it definitely is is very interesting. Yeah, and and the, and the question of internal storage with um, birds is interesting because they, I mean, they're capable of adding fat, but especially a lot of these birds will, um, like especially chickadees and uh, that that live in really cold environments, they don't migrate in the winter, and that's part of probably why they cache food instead. Uh, but it's so cold out overnight that they actually will lose almost. In, almost all of their fat reserves every single mm -hmm. night in the winter. And so that's kind of, you know, fluctuating dramatically uh, in the morning. And then in the morning, they seem to be focused more on, um, on eating and forming caches. And then they seem to take more caches out of storage before they go to bed at night to kind of prepare for the, for the night. Right, right. And I, I think Alex actually has has another question. Um, I mean, he also says great talks. So I think he's enjoyed the, the session today. Um, he also said, if you if you deplete the larder of a larder caching uh, caching um, uh, species, uh, the oh animal, does it increase caching? Um, you know, those are great questions. It hasn't hasn't been hasn't been done. The um, I mean, larders are, are interesting because they can be multi year because you only see larder hoarding. I mean, most bird, what's interesting is most birds scatter hoard. Very, there's only a couple of species that larder hoard, whereas most, most mammals larder hoard mm -hmm. and defend a nest full of, and, and, and very few species actually are obligate scatter hoarders. Um, so what you see is with larder hoarding is um, cone eaters, where they create this midden and then they bury cones in, um, in the midden, and they can actually survive multiple years of scarcity because the cones are, uh, are, are they basically predate the cone. They can't, they can't germinate. Whereas the scatter hoarders, um, 
the, the caches all escape. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I'm just trying to think larder. I know in the, in, in the lab, if both in Siberian chipmunks and, and Miriam's kangaroo rats, we set up, um, well, we did the work in kangaroo rats where if we set up experimental um, stealing of pilfery, of, 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 of scatter hordes, the, the kangaroo rats started moving their caches into their nest. And the same thing has been shown in, um, uh, in Siberian chipmunks. And, and there's a species of scatter hoarding Chinese rat where if you make them, um, that you can you can actually they make them anosmic and then you and then that will switch their strategy from away from pilfering obviously i mean the, the whole question of um pilfering and how it's visual dependent in birds and but 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 squirrels have both vision and olfaction it, it's a completely different economic um story right and, and it is, this is not about <clears throat> not about larder hoarding but I know there has been, there, like, there is some flexibility even within scatter hoarding in terms of learning what, you know, what's not reliable, like what's an unreliable location to cash in or what's an unreliable food that's going to go bad after a certain amount of time. So there's probably some, uh, yeah, there's probably some flexibility there as well. You know, I, I think uh, they're incredibly, they're incredibly um, flexible. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot, of, there's, there's so much there that we're just, we just don't, I mean, just from looking at the, you know, like, especially the red squirrels, the, the fantastic work, 20 years of um, studies of, of known individuals by Stan Booten and others and McAdam in Canada. I, I, I suggest everyone, you know, if you want to look at the real costs and benefits of lar hoarding, go, go to that literature. Hmm. I have a question. Um, which I guess I can extend to both of you. So, um, Hannah, I saw in your you mentioned in your talk that there is uh, that we see this enlargement in the, the hippocampus hippocampus in um, like food caching species. Mm -hmm. um, and it also got me thinking about um, it. So it's a, it's a multi part question. But so first of all, um, do you do you also see um, like um, experience uh driven plasticity in the size of the hippocampus i know you, i know there's evidence of that in like in humans right with um i think it was like the taxi driver study where they're um moving around london they get they, they have large enlarged hippocampuses i think right yeah. but um yeah is that i wondered if there was evidence of something similar in birds and then um kind of as an extension um do you also see or expect to see um plasticity in the um the function um and performance of these um the, the, the these kind of place like place cell like cells that, you, that you've re reported um with experience mm -hmm. in um, yeah so and so in terms of experience affecting the size of the hippocampus even you know within individuals there's definitely evidence for that um uh not only seasonally like i like i mentioned but um also, if you, I believe even if you bring one of these birds into the lab for too long, their hippocampus will eventually get a little smaller. You know, luckily that hasn't seemed to have you know, affected the, the main result, but there is, um, there is that effect. And uh, again, uh, Pravasudov in, uh, in Reno has found really interesting differences within species, within uh, mountain chickadees living at different elevations. Um, that also seems to affect kind of their both their memory abilities and feature and and the size of the hippocampus um yeah and, and the second part of your question was about whether we would see changes in the place cells or what would, can you repeat that yeah yeah where the plasticity might also affect some of the data that you've that you've seen yeah i would i would love to kind of do those experiments i think we don't know mm -hmm. yet yeah and I guess can I, I, can I, can I jump in and yeah. and, uh, and so we we've um, Pierre Lavenet, who was a postdoc in the lab, 
uh, and Mike Steele and I showed that squirrel brains actually are largest in October. And this is, you know, there's a Danal effect. You have change in absolute brain size changes throughout the year in small mammals. And it was surprising because you normally expect that during the breeding season. We found it in the caching season mm -hmm. and it was actually largest in October. And these were, you know, animals, you know, uh, trapped in, in under natural conditions they we didn't follow individuals but then the brain size was actually smallest in june when the food is uh it's during the breeding season but it's, food is very scarce and and intermediate in january when they they're basically just retrieving and so my interpretation and we found not no no extra neurogenesis in dentate um but we did see increased um volume of ca1 and so that would be in the CA1 would be where you're finding place cells in, in the, the homolog um, in, in, the, in, the, in the tit and in the bird. And, um, and, in, and that's where you, would find, you expect to find it in the, in the rat, um, these really mm -hmm. small place fields that are you know, encoding specific points in space. And, um, and so the interpretation is that, that making that map in the fall is what's the real, it's not remembering the cache, it's making the map and remembering while you're making it to optimize that distribution of nut species by, um, by chunking and, and optimal dispersion. And yeah. anyway. Oh, that, that, um, that's really, that's really interesting. And um, it's actually, it has me thinking about how within, within birds, there's different species that kind of seem to food cache on different timescales. So there's yes. some species yes. like yes. I don't know, for right. any bird aficionados, the nutcracker yes. that I showed in my video actually tends to uh, retrieve over quite long time scales, like kind of more, maybe more like squirrels uh, storing in the fall and early winter and then retrieving actually in February when they start breeding, they kind of get a head start on breeding by retrieving the, their caches. Whereas the, uh, the chickadees and the titmice that we study are the prolific cachers, they cache obsessively, but it's a little bit more like snacking throughout the day where they will cache and then retrieve on the order of hours and days up to at least a month, but on a somewhat shorter time scale than um, the nutcrackers. And so, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting if there's some, I don't think That's, it's been yeah, done in no. that much detail, but if there's a difference in kind of how these things change seasonally relative and to- And there's when. a lot, there's like, you know, Northwestern crows, they, um, they cache food to feed the female in the nest and South Island Robin cached worms in the morning and even before, you know, the same thing, even before nighttime, you know. Um, but squirrels actually don't, the nutcrackers are interesting because they really cache and they really don't return because it's snow covered until like February. But the squirrels, they're living in the same area. So they are, they're constantly, if you, a squirrel is not, is all every day, all day, if you see them, from November, you know, through March, squirrels are checking their caches, and you will actually see them sniff and dig one up and move it, or sniff and 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 just put the leaves back on back on top of it. So I think it's not a long-term yeah. memory task. Sure. It's um, that's that's why I think you get the real increase in brain size, and and um, we also found we did a um, a study comparing spatial coding frames of reference. In, on campus squirrels and males in the fall used local cute use local features of landmarks whereas males in the spring did not so this is um basically they were using a um the external frame of reference which is what you see in male rats encoding in a maze but male squirrels so they think like male rats in the spring when they're you know, you know, I think basically when their hippocampus is less is less um, exercised, but in the fall, um, they actually seem to encode space much more precisely, more more similar to what we'd expect um, from kind of CA1 function. So uh, yeah, so I think there's enormous amount of plasticity. Yeah, and it, it that does. That 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 makes me wonder also, um, like for in squirrels, do you also um, see changes in kind of strategy through life lifespan as well? Like as 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 squirrels yeah. become, let's say, like more experienced or, or yeah, learn different things about their environment. Like are there shifts in their strategies? Well, you know, I'm this, this you know fascinating work by Nikki Clayton on pilfering, showing that scrub jays don't pilfer until someone has been pilfering 
pilfered from them. And I think, I, I really think that's so interesting because that reminds me of my cousin when I was five years old teaching me to shoplift, you know. It's like, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> I was immediately caught and I never did it again. Um, <laughs> But I know I think it's, it's and we're actually studying um, squirrels right um, rescue squirrels right now. We're looking at the development of cash decisions, um, and I, I I mean again squirrels are so slow developing and they um, they have such high mortality their first year. So I think it's 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 going to be a fascinating to see how these decisions um, develop. Yeah, great great question. I've got a question um, for Hannah. Can I ask Hannah a question? Oh, that's so, a, that's great. That's exactly what I'm mean. <laughs> I'm fascinated by so, so your work really settles that argument of the homology of the hippocampus of the bird, mm -hmm. where the question is whether or not the anterior or what, what used to be called ventral is homologous to dentate gyrus versus um, hippocampus proper, I mean, or CA1. Mm -hmm. and, and so it seems what you're saying is that you're seeing the homology and function is is um, anterior with dorsal CA1 in, in the rat. So, but but place cells are also in ventral CA1. Um, I mean, they're they're larger. Yeah. I mean, there's there's, there's place cells in dentate. There's, so, what do you expect to find in posterior? Um, I mean, is it that it's the task is wrong, and there are place cells? Um, and I'm also very interested. Do you know where the um, factory inputs come up, come into mm. the, um, the the hippocampus, the avian hippocampus. Uh, the, the olfactory inputs. Yeah, yeah. So it turns out that uh, chickadees actually have the smallest olfactory bulb out of any bird that's been studied. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't know the exact pathway because I, I haven't looked into that. But um, and okay, there have been okay. studies showing that if you you know you have them cache and you then move those caches somewhere else. They will look yeah. where they left it. They will not, you know, sniff out. They will not sniff out the uh, the real cash, the real food but, locations. Um, you know, it's interesting because you know zebra finches are very olfactory, mm -hmm. and and they you know use it. Um, and and actually, there's a study of magpies that if this was a great old study that if you douse a raisin in cod liver oil and cache it, you know, in the wild, magpies are more likely to find the raisin that's covered with cod, cod liver oil than not covered with cod liver oil. So there's an old, old study, but so there's, so there's not, it's not, it's not, there might be some species of birds mm -hmm. that are actually using, using odor. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. About the, no, I mean, the, yeah, the, some birds have amazing senses of, I mean, of course, um, you know, carrion birds um, yes. have, an yeah. have some of the most amazing sense. So it's kind of the whole spectrum. Um, yeah. But yeah, for, based on these previous, previous experiments, we haven't, you know, yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. like it's not yeah. as important for these food caching birds and that they seem to depend pretty purely on vision, which is actually something that I'm yeah. interested in going forwards with in yeah. the future yeah. is looking at kind of the inputs yeah. on yeah. the visual system and making these comparisons to how we yeah. experience space and how we how we navigate. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. fascinating. Um, but in terms of your, your question about the homology of the yeah. hippocampus and, and these axes, yeah. um, so First, I just wanted to kind of yeah, clarify that the, so we, yeah, we see this gradient along this long axis, you know, corresponding to dorsal ventral hippocampus in, in rats. Um, I, the, the dentate gyrus versus, you know, CA1, CA3 axis is, I have sampled technically, you know, I've sampled across it, but yeah. it's, the divisions are not very clear in, in yeah, yeah, yeah. along that axis. You know, it's, it seems like yeah, there's, yeah. Um, there is homology based on genetic studies of dentate gyrus being kind of that most medial kind of corner of the yeah, hippocampus. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I looked across that, that kind of distribution from the most medial part to the more lateral part and I didn't see yeah. anything systematic, but it, you know, it could be a sampling yeah, issue. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, but yeah, but so it's, it's, it's overall, it seems like these kind of, we can set up these kind of tra this coordinate transformation, right? Between yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and rodents and, uh, and, and, and also, you know, amphibians, I mean, all reptiles yeah. have that layout yeah. um, exactly. actually. So, I mean, that's what's interesting. I mean, the hippocampus yeah. is probably the most, one of the most conservative structures. Yeah. I mean, the medial pallium is, yeah. and, and the, the septal hippocampal complex is, is just so conserved. So yeah. I wonder, 
now what what is the anterior hippocamp i mean medial pallium me, no the anterior medial cortex in a lizard should be yeah. doing something similar maybe yeah yeah that would be interesting that would be really interesting yeah. and it, and of course in 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 other non-avian reptiles the hippocampus actually does seem more clearly layered i, I showed the slide yeah. of the bird hippocampus yeah. I mean, there's like yeah. a hint of you know a cell density but there's no really clear yeah, yeah. layers but in reptiles they have this th three layered um, hippocampus. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a great study in rattlesnakes that if you imp if you um, challenge a male rattlesnake during the the um, breeding season and carry him in a bucket like a hundred meters every day, so he has to find his way back. They they got this incredible increase in increased um, hip medial cortex mm. volume. Mm. So short term, like a month, you know doubling in size and I, I keep telling behavioral neuroscientists why don't you why aren't you studying pacific rattlesnakes in your lab i don't get it you know <laughs> but i mean there, there may be there may be even more plasticity in in other groups than in birds mm -hmm. and mammals mm -hmm. i mean uh, on a similar note i was thinking about interrhinal for example and like red cells yeah. like I was thinking about sort yeah. of like how 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 sort of far does this comparison um, uh, go? Because that mm -hmm. that would be really interesting, right? Like if there if it was that like homologous. Mm -hmm. I mean, also the fact that you found like sharp white ripples that look. Exa I mean, that's really that's super interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um. And I, I I guess I had one question about like like sleep, um, mm -hmm. and how uh these birds like what their kind of sleep cycle is. And actually, I was going to ask something similar about squirrels as well, to be honest. I don't really have a feeling for whether they sleep in bouts or whether they whether the, the structure of their sleep cycle is similar to, for example, like rats or, 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 or mice. Um, um, that I I mean, yeah, I mean, they're diurnal um, and they, they definitely have, you know, they're kind of active at dawn and then they come back. We, we definitely we will be doing an experiment and halfway through the experiment, you look up and your squirrel is sleeping on a nap, he's taking a nap on a branch above you. And there's nothing you can do but wait for the squirrel to finish its nap. So for, for what it's worth, that's that's the that's how they sleep. Um, I mean, I should also, you know, I actually, was, I, I just published a, a review of, um, uh, the, the air breathing hippocampal function um, and and one thing I pointed out was the um, you know tooth whales I mean this has been known since the 19th century that tooth whales have a, res a vestigial hippocampus but their enterrhinal is actually um, normal in size so they have this is and and so if you want to see paper just published in this special issue on evolution of neuroscience in the philosophical transactions um, where I address this but uh, and 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 why and why you know bats have grid cells and place cells but they don't have um hippocampal theta associated with um with with those and so why why is that anyway you can see my see my can you, paper can you, my, can you tell us a little more about the um about the air breathing and the why you think that's true in the whales um well so, so what my, my argument is that the, that um, the hippocampus is actually evolved as a um, olfactor hippocampal navigation system and it began when tetrapods moved to land because the um, olfactory system suddenly became um, constrained to small volatile molecule molecules which could be used for spatial orientation but could not be used for the other functions that it had had been used when it was a fish a fish system and so that if you look at um, what you basically see is this correlation between both hippocampal size and olfactory system size and space use. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true in, in birds like, you know, homing pigeons that are, are you know, bred for navigation, a larger hippocampus, also a larger olfactory bulb. And um, so, so you see that this is a very general um, um, pattern. So I think there's, um, so my, my argument actually is that you can't really separate in mammals um, olfaction and hippocampal function. And the, the toothed whale is the only group that's lost the main olfactory system. Um, even baleen whales have retained a little bit, but tooth, toothed whales um, have essentially are completely anosmic. And so instead, what they've, what bats and, and um, dolphins have done is replace spatial faction with spatial audition. They both independently evolved echolocation, very, very precise means of orienting in space. And so my interpretation of the bat data is that the reason 
um, is because the reason that, that theta is actually a marker of using olfaction um, to um, calculate distance by the hippocampus. And, and that's why you see type one, type two theta varies by species. So for example, cats who are ambush predators, they actually have type two theta where it, where theta increases when they're actually just um, stationary and staring. Whereas that's not true. In a rat, you only see type one theta, which is only, a, you know, it only is activated when the animal's actually moving. So anyway, I, all of these things I think can be explained by thinking about olfaction. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with olfaction as <laughs> many people <laughs> know. But I think, I think it's really important to understand um, hippocampus and navigation, um, to under, not to forget it. And maybe then a chickadee is, is, but is a pure example of really yeah. vision. Yeah, 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 and and you know humans as well, right? No, hu and hu <laughs> not not and purely, human. but primarily. Well, I mean, there's new new work on humans that memory consolidation is um, enhanced by nasal respiration, but not oral respiration. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have an association between oral and nasal respiration, which I mean, there, there's actually so I, I again this is I'm I'm providing an evolutionary um, explanation for that. Is that this is so deep in our evolutionary history? That um, that you you again you can't really separate memory and olfaction in humans. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of actually on that note. I mean, I think what's interesting about food caching in general, especially with regards to the hippocampus, is that you know, like the story of how we, as a field, have interpreted like hippocampal function over the last like I don't know fifty or sixty years. Like I feel like we've gone from. In, in a very broad sense, right, like from it being sort of the center of memory, right, to the center of like spatial navigation. And now I think there is this, you know, uniting, at least, I, I mean, I know more, more about rodent, um, I guess, hippocampus work on like cognitive maps and, and, and this idea of like it being like an associatory uh, sort of cortical area, um, kind of uh, out, even outside of pure spatial representation. And I think the really interesting thing about food caching, right, is that you need both. Um, but that also means that you kind of, it makes it difficult sometimes perhaps to separate out exactly what role the hippocampus is playing. Um, uh, like, do, do you think that, the, again, this is in very general terms, but like sort of switching from um, sort of uh, spatial representation of where, for example, food has been cached to having to retrieve that, you know, um, consolidation through sharp wave ripples. I mean, uh, clearly this is one area that is able to kind of perform in some sense both functions. And, and I'm kind of always curious about how people feel, um, like it, again, in very broad terms, like how how this could, you know, how this is possible in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely even, you know, despite my focus on, <clears throat> on place cells, I'm definitely thinking of the hippocampus as much more of a general purpose associator, right? It just happens that when you, when when the animal is not doing anything, it's just wand, you know, wandering around. You see play cells, um, but like you mentioned, in, in posterior hippocampus or during other tasks, like even I've done a linear track task where there is only food at certain locations, and just like in mammals, you see kind of overrepresentation of the task space. Um, so I think it's much more of a general purpose, you know, whatever is relevant for, for behavior. And, but that was the original debate: was 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 it working memory or was it spatial memory? And um, and it, it's it's and my argument is that space is a computational um, structure for re representing information. And if you think about uh, great mnemonicists, right, the the memory palace, uh, all these techniques are spatial. And so I don't think that's. An, I mean, this is why you need to think about this in terms of evolution. Obviously, it was it was. Um, First, you, you start with an ability to map space externally, and then you can use those same computational structures to map information internally, yeah. which is, I mean, I think one of the prop, the confusion is the um, only studying um, a very small group of species in very constricted and not even asking them to do things that they actually do. Uh, because even mice and rats have very complex behaviors, social behaviors, spatial behaviors, that aren't, aren't being tapped into. There's, there's, a, great, there's a great study of a, a rat, um, releasing a rat in a small island in um, someplace in the South Pacific, just, and they found that these, um, these male rats were covering like, you know, 11, 11 hectares a night looking for female because they knew it was, they put one rat with no females and the rat, you know, and then they tracked its, its movement. So anyway. 
yeah, I've, I read a book um, a, a few years ago now, but uh, I think it's all about mice or something. I can't remember what exactly. Yes. But, yeah, yeah. Do, do you see? Yes, right. And, 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 oh, oh, that's it's a lovely it's book. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's written in yes. the 60s or something, but like it's, tracking yeah. with uh, so anyway, exactly. anyway, it's a little off topic, yeah, but yeah, it's super, yeah. super interesting. And um, I have one last comment from uh, Alex Koselnik. Uh, he just wants to say, regarding hippocampus size, don't forget bookkeeping in reproductive parasitic birds, which, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I need to <laughs> find out more about that. And I'm... Like like cowbirds. Yep. Yeah, and which, which is not, I mean... I mean, that's okay. Well, I, we could talk forever, but I mean, cowpox is it's interesting because it's not just social. It's actually very, it's very precisely spatial because you only see that effect in females mm -hmm. who are the ones who have to remember where the nests are. Mm -hmm. And the males just follow along. And so they don't have the hippocampal side and they don't have the hippocampal memory. And this is Alex's work. <laughs> um, I think uh, we are now um, out of time. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, we can we can we could talk forever. I mean, I agree. It's one of those topics, right? Where you you know, there's and and especially having that um, cross species comparison. So anyway, uh, but thank you both so much again um, for speaking today. Uh, I mean, we've all really enjoyed um, hearing your talks and this discussion as well afterwards. Um, and so uh, we are still in the process of scheduling the final episode of our um, second season. Uh, I think it's likely to be early June. Um, but we are going to be, at least the, certainly the theme has been decided, which will be um, collective, collective foraging. Um, but we will announce details on that uh, as soon as they're available, hopefully in the next week or so. Um, but thank you also to our audience for um, turning up today. Very nice to have, have all of you here um, and see you all hopefully soon. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks both for the, really for the great talk. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you.